Look, that population model was today. I still I think the marker is maybe just gone for good. So we'll. Is it on the bottom? Ah, it is on. Thank you. So population model is we'll do a little separation of variables. I mean, I think more interesting than that, we'll start to see how we might analyze a differential equation without solving it. But let's start with the so-called general population model. So let's say that we have an animal population and we have a birth rate. I'll use function notation here. Um, a lot of textbooks and people don't, but these are allowed to be functions. They're allowed to change with time. So beta t is births per unit time, as we put it, births per year or whatever, except that we're working in a general population and we don't want to commit to years or months or anything in specific. So we say unit time, beta and delta, deaths per unit time. Now, if we have that birth rate and that death rate, then over a small time interval, delta t, the number of births is the birth rate times the current population which is also a function of time, times delta t. And the number of deaths is the death rate times the population times delta t. So the change in the population, I don't, uh, I hope you remember this delta notation. If not, delta is used for change. So over some small time interval, over some small change in time. And now we're asking how the population changes. Well, it's the number of births minus the number of deaths. And the births and the deaths both have a population in them, and they both have a delta t in them. So we can pull the p of t and the delta t out of that subtraction. Dividing both sides by delta t, Delta P over Delta T is approximately beta of T 
minus delta of t times p of t. And now this is um, kind of disguised because we're using the delta notation, but what we have on the left-hand side is a difference quotient. It's the change in population over the change in time. And if we have a difference quotient, and we take the limit as the interval we're looking at goes to zero, that approximate inequality is going to become an exact inequality. We're taking the limit of both sides of the equation, except notice on the right-hand side of the equation, there are no delta t's. So taking the limit doesn't do anything. And we can just scribble that out. And the limit of a difference quotient is what? Fundamental math knowledge here, but again, maybe maybe it's because I'm using this delta that you're struggling. If we rewrote that left-hand side of the equality as a difference quotient, it would look like this. When we last saw it, instead of deltas, we have written it using H's, and the limit of that as H approaches zero is the derivative. It's the definition of the derivative. So the derivative of P with respect to T is the birth rate minus the death rate times the current population. And this is the general population model, and the general population model is always true. Now, that being said, saying that this is always true doesn't mean that it's always easy to you. Was. And I mean, in reality, in most real world situations, the birth rate functions and the death rate functions are going to be messy and convoluted. I mean, you're not going to be able to say, well, the birth rate's this quadratic and the death rate's that cubic or whatever you would, if you wanted to use this model, you would have to use a computer. Like you could have data of a deer population and you'd get the birth rate from that data and you'd get the death rate from that data and you do everything technologically. But we're going to look at a few relatively simple um, population models where we can solve stuff by hand. We've already seen one population model. Not 
Nope, I don't want those to be equal, but where the birth rate and death rate are constants. So beta t minus delta t is a constant. We get dp dt is a constant times p. And this was an example we looked at when we introduced separation of variables. We solved this equation. And we wind it up with that, that the population is increasing exponentially. And this K is the constant birth rate minus the constant death rate. Let's do another example. I mean, this example is from the textbook. It's pretty artificial, but it will at least let us see how we could use this model. Suppose a disease strikes a fish population and as a result they stop reproducing. And now let's make some assumption about the death rate. And honestly, in this section, we're normally going to assume that the death rate is constant. So if nothing else, this example is an example where we'll have a non-constant death rate. Say the death rate is proportional to one over the square root of p. This might seem artificial, and of course it is artificial. It's from a homework problem in an undergraduate differential equations class, but birth rates and death rates often do depend on the size of a population. So being proportional to one over the square root of P is not an outrageous thing to assume. Then let's put some data on the board. We know what this data is doing for us. Differential equations have infinitely many solutions. So giving information like this is going to let us have a unique solution. So maybe there were 900 fish initially, and after six weeks, there are 441 left. Let's see what we can do with this differential equation. Let's see if we can set it up. Let's see if we can solve it.
as far as setting it up, we're plugging and playing with the general population model. We've got K Nope, no K. We've got beta T and delta T and P of T. The K I was thinking of is going to go inside the parentheses. The birth rate is zero because the fish are no longer reproducing. The death rate is proportional to a square root, which is a fancy way of saying that it's a constant time is one over the square root. All multiplied by the population. Notice that I'm not using function notation for population, even though population is a function of time. Again, that's very normal in differential equations. You just have to get used to looking at something like this and saying, Okay, well, K some kind of constant of proportionality, P's a function. One of them's a constant, one of them's a function, even though neither of them are using function notation. And that simplifies. P divided by the square root of P is the square root of P. So that's where that comes from. And this differential equation, let's think. We don't integrate. Um, for integration to work, we'd need T's on the right instead of P's. But we might be able to separate variables. We'd better be able to, because it's the only other technique we know. And indeed, this is a separable differential equation. We can bring the square root of P over here. There aren't any T's, but we'll bring the DT over to the right. Let me, I'm going to rewrite one over the square root of P as P to the negative one half just because we're about to integrate, and I always struggle with that integral if I don't rewrite it first. Now we'll integrate the right, we'll integrate the left. So bump the power up by one. Divide by that new power. Notice that we get two unknowns here. And the reason we're getting two unknowns is that this problem didn't give you a full suite of information. It told you that the death rate is proportional to something, but it didn't tell you what the constant of proportionality is. So in addition to that constant of integration, we've got this unknown K. Well, if we have two unknowns, 
we should be able to figure those out if we're given two pieces of information, which you see that we were. Okay, I say, say that as if we're done. We're not done. Um, we'll divide both sides of this equality by two. We won't try to be clever here. We'll just write that down. And then we'll square both sides. And here is our general solution. So K is not known to us, but we can figure it out. C is not known to us, but we can figure it out, or at least hopefully we can. We're told that initially, when t equals zero, the population was 900. So let's see what happens if we, let me load the calculator up. I think we might need it. So let's see what happens if we let t be zero and p be 900. Well, if t is zero, k times t is zero. Get 900 equals c over two squared. You can always tell that a differential equation comes from a textbook and not the real world when you get nice numbers instead of ugly decimals. Um, the square root of 900 is 30. So C equals 60. And now that's I'm going to erase the right-hand side. Does everybody have this copied down? So when the T equals six, we'll measure time in weeks. The population is 441. 441 equals 6K plus 60 over 2 squared. Let's see. I can't. Do it in my head, but is the square root of four, four, one something nice? It is. 
This is indeed a textbook problem. Take the square root of both sides, it's 21. Multiply both sides by two. Absolutely not. Something's gone wrong. Troubleshooting in front of a class is the absolute worst. If I don't see it pretty quickly, I'll just leave it be. But, but K cannot be negative. If K were negative, that would say that this disease is causing the death rate to be negative, that fish are coming back from the grave. And surely that is not true. So, oh, I know what happened. I made a mistake here and it's just carried through this entire problem. I forgot the negative sign when I wrote dp dt equals negative. So negative at negative kt and now we Sadly, have to go back a few steps. Well, fortunately, t equals zero is a pretty quick one. 900 equals c over 2 squared. In fact, our c isn't changing. Um, 30 equals c over 2, 60 equals c. But now, hopefully, we will get a positive k when t equals 6, p equals 441. Square root. Multiply by two. And now something that makes sense. We, uh, T is uh, six. Sorry, I was in such a hurry to get back to where we were, then I sort of made new mistakes. So now we subtract 60, we get a negative number. Um, let's see, 42 and eight is 50. Um, so negative 18. We get again 
a very nice number that tells us that this comes from a textbook. And now we have the population function. And we could, for example, if we wanted to know when the fish went extinct, well, they're going extinct after 20 weeks. If we set this equal to zero, we'll get 20. We could also go to Desmos and just look at the thing. Negative 3t plus 60 over 2 squared. It's going to want a y equals. And scroll out so we can see it. There is our fish population. Obviously, we have to apply some degree of common sense to this. This model tells us that after 20 weeks, the fish population is extinct. Um, this model also tells us that the fish population then re bounds, which of course is not true. We have to, as I say, use some common sense and say, well, once the fish are extinct, they're extinct. So this, so problems like this, I mean, they have their place and they certainly show up in the real world, but they're making a lot of modeling assumptions. I mean, the assumption that um, the death rate is proportional to one over the square root of P, that's a modeling assumption. Like all modeling assumptions, it's probably not exactly true. It's close enough to being true that whoever is studying this theoretical lake thinks they're going to get useful information out of it. And because the modeling assumptions aren't perfectly accurate, you know, our answer can't be perfectly accurate. Maybe the fish will struggle on for 25 weeks. Maybe they'll succumb in 15. But we predict that in about 20 weeks, the fish will be extinct. From this very specific example, Let's look at a very general and very famous population model. And we'll solve the population model. Its solution is also very famous. But even before we solve it, we'll see how we can study it without solving it. And this very famous population model is called the logistic model. Let me 